Well, hello again, everybody. I felt like I just said hello to about 300 of you, but uh, it's time for the other 1,000 something. Okay, while, while we're waiting, I have a question for you. Um, if you're not in the United States, do you want to post your country? Right, they're not in the United States, maybe they're asleep. Right, if you're not in Berkeley, uh, you want to post your state. Might be California, that's allowed. Whoa, 1 a.m., there's dedication, Jessica. Jenna, 2.18 a.m., my goodness. All right, wonderful. Thank you for coming. California, all right. The Netherlands, fantastic. Yeah, 10, 18 a.m., honestly. Turkey, look at that, look at that. We're from everywhere, I love this. Unit one, that is a state in its own right, definitely. Canada, El Salvador, I'm sorry, I'm not catching them. They're just flying off. Fifth floor of Moffitt, there you go, new state. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. I'm so sorry about the fiasco with Zoom. Oh my gosh. I really, really appreciate it. Stick around and coming, coming back to join us. Okay, so I think maybe now is a good time for us to get started. Give me just a second here and we'll be on our way. Welcome to Data 8, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, all right, so the semester is underway. What I wanted to do today is uh, introduce myself and um, my co-teacher and share with you what we're gonna be doing in this course this semester. Uh, hi, I'm Dave Wagner. Um, I'm so excited to be here with all of you this semester. I'm really looking forward and hoping to see some of you in office hours. Um, I come from the uh, from computer science. Um, I love this course. One of the areas that I study in computer security and recently um, privacy and uh, machine learning. Um, and I am super fortunate to be joined by my co-instructor, Professor Aniyad Akari, who is um, a superstar for this course. She is one of the original creators of Data8 and a, a brilliant um, teacher and statistician. And Ani, um, would you like to say hello to everyone and introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, David. Uh, likewise, uh, I am thrilled to be teaching with David Wagner, who's too modest to say that he too is one of the developers of this course. 
Um, we started on this journey, uh, oh, about six years ago now. And for six years, we have wanted to teach together. Finally, we can do this. And finally, we're back teaching the thing that we, the, the course that we really love. I came to um, statistics from physics via mathematics via uh, probability theory. And, uh, you know, it's all about making decisions based on evidence. And uh, the events of the world are telling us how important it is to be able to do that. So I've made my life trying to uh, basically, you know, work with people to develop that skill. And so that is the thing that I love to do. And that's why I love doing the date. Great. Okay, so um, uh, let me also tell you, oops, this is just not my day, is it? Um, let me also tell you about uh, the course staff who are joining us. Um, uh, you have a great team of super qualified and knowledgeable course staff who are here and would love to help you with your learning. Um, you can look on our course webpage to um, learn about our teaching assistants and our tutors um, who are going to be one of your main primary points of contact with this course. So data science, this is a data science course. Let me tell you a little bit about what you're gonna learn in this course and what data science is. Uh, lots of ways to think about data science. Um, one way to think about it is um, that we're uh, learning about the world um, using data. And in this course, we have a specific focus on um, analyzing and understanding data uh, using computation to help us. So three major themes you're gonna see in this course. Uh, first theme you're gonna see is data exploration. When you've got a new data set, you've got a bunch of data that got handed to you Maybe the first step is to try to understand what you got. And so often during an exploration phase, we're going to look to see, are there any patterns that we might spot, any trends, any interesting themes that seem to come out of the data. Uh, visualizations are our friend here. So we're gonna teach you in this portion of the course, um, how to work with data, how to look for these trends, how to make visualizations to help you understand what's in the data. Are you taking notes? Hi, thanks. Uh, we have, we'll be uh, recording this lecture and we will post the recording afterwards. Uh, if you have questions, I would love to see your questions. Please feel free to post your questions in the chat. We have people who are monitoring and would be glad to um, answer questions you've got. The second, um, second, a uh, third of this course, we'll be looking at an area called inference. I see some of you are saying there are folks who can't get in. Um, uh, unfortunately, due to um, mishap with Zoom this morning, this room has capacity for only a thousand. So if you know any friends who can't get into this Zoom room, go to the post on Ed and you should find a link there to YouTube. And we're also streaming live on YouTube and those folks can join us on YouTube. We should be fixed. Hopefully this should be a one-time occurrence and we should be able to fix this before lecture on Friday. I'm so sorry about this. Unfortunately, everything seemed to be working when I tested it, but unfortunately I didn't have a way to test with 500 people showing up. So this is one of the joys of the first lecture. All right, so the second theme in this course you'll, we'll teach you about is inference. And inference is about using data to draw reliable conclusions about the world. So in exploration, we might identify some potential patterns or some trends and inference. Now we can go test whether those paths are something that we can count on, something that we can rely on. And so this portion is going to use a lot of a technique from statistics. So we'll teach you a bunch of statistics in this course. And then finally, the third theme in this course is uh, prediction. And the last third of this course will teach you how to make predictions about the future. In other words, make informed guesses about what might happen in the future or things that you haven't observed based on data that you do have. And there, there are a bunch of techniques out there 
Um, one of them you'll learn about, you may have heard of machine learning, which is uh, revolutionizing uh, a bunch of technology areas. And we'll give you a teeny bit of introduction to uh, machine learning. Okay, so um, that's the structure of this course. The purpose of this course is to give you a first introduction to data science so you get some of the major themes. Um, it's not enough to be have a career as a data scientist, but it'll get you started. One of the things that's unique about this course is this course is um, designed to be uh, accessible. So you don't need a huge amount of math background. So for instance, how many of you have never had any statistics course before this? Yes, lots of people. All right. If you've never had this course, this course is for you. This course was designed for you. You don't need any stats background. How many of you have never had any computer science or computer programming course? If you've never had any computer science or any computer programming, this course is also for you. This course is designed to be for everyone. So if you get lost or if we're, I uh, start talking about something you don't understand, I want you to interrupt me and, and help me out because our goal here is to make this course something something that every for everyone and we're going to try to teach you everything you need. We're going to teach you everything you need to know about computation. Um, we're going to spare you from heavy math. We're going to teach you everything you need to know about statistics so you can do data analysis. Let me pause at this moment and say that I love seeing questions in the chat or reactions or feedback. So please don't feel bad about sharing comments in the chat as we go. All right, so that's this course. There are also, we're also accompanied by connector courses. I don't know if you've, how many of you know about this, but we offer uh, connectors. These are uh, separate courses um, that let you see some of the applications of data science. So in this course, we're gonna teach you the core concept and core techniques. But applications are a really critical part of data science. And if you want to be a good data scientist, you can't just look at the techniques in isolation. Um, it's really valuable to apply them to the real world. And so our connectors give you a chance to apply these ideas to a bunch of different domains. So there might be a, a really fun way to see these uh, methods um, uh, in action. Um, there are also often smaller courses where you can learn about a new topic area. Um, you can find a list of connector courses online. Um, let me just highlight um, uh, four of them that currently have seats available if you might be interested in taking a connector course designed to be taken together with Data8, could be taken after Data8, but um, ideally you would take them together. Um, you could use uh, political, you could look into political science. Um, uh, you could look into physics 88 using data science for physics. You could look at data 88E and you could look at um, uh, EPS, Earth and Planetary Science uh, 88, which is um, titled Pi Earth. Uh, it's using uh, data science to uh, study the earth around us. All right, any questions about the course or course content? Not all the connector courses are available every semester. Every semester, some of them are available, maybe some new ones. Will you need to install Python or spe specific software? Nope, you're gonna do everything through your web browser. I'm gonna show you what it looks like. You can find the links in this slides by going to our course webpage and you'll find there a link to today's slides. And if you look in today's slides, you can get to all the links there in the slides. Connector courses are usually a smaller number of units. I don't remember exactly off the top of my head. What's the difference between data science and statistics? Um, definitely there's a strong relationship. We're gonna be using a lot of techniques from statistics. Data science is um, focused at analyzing data. So we're also gonna spend a fair amount of time on uh, computational methods that will help us with data analysis. And we're gonna uh, care a lot about applications and case studies. 
but definitely data science and statistics are very closely related uh, fields. I'll show you how to access the software you need. Uh, you can decide about when the reading is useful to you. Uh, the textbook was written by the course instructor, so it was designed to accompany these lectures. We follow a very similar uh, content and style. So if you're someone who likes to see the book before the movie, you could read the textbook beforehand. If you're someone who likes to watch lecture, you could watch lecture and see if it all makes sense. And then if there's some parts that don't make sense, then you could go back and do the reading afterwards. Figure out what style works for you. It's everyone may have a different style. Yes, you'll be learning the basics of Python. It's a programming language that will help you uh, program the computer and, and enable us to do a bunch of powerful data analysis, even on very large data sets. Readings are not required. You decide whether they're useful to you. This course is definitely has an element that's an access, a uh, combination of stats and programming. All right, lots more courses. I'm gonna let our GSIs answer more questions in the chat. I'm gonna move on. Uh, so let me talk to you about the structure of Data8 and what are the major courses you're going to you're going to be uh, doing in this course. Uh, you're, there'll be lecture. Um, we're going to offer a lecture live and also recorded. I think it's better for you to attend live, but you figure out what works for you. There's a textbook, as I mentioned, that is free, totally free. Hooray! Um, there is a weekly lab section. Lab start this week. That means today or Thursday or Friday. So go to your lab this week. You'll go to lab every week. Um, lab will give you uh, practice. Um, it'll give you hands-on uh, application of ideas that you see in lecture. Um, you should be, if you're enrolled, you should be assigned a lab section. You can also get credit without attending lab if you do the lab remotely on your own, on your own computer uh, before and turn it in before Wednesday, 9 a.m. So in future weeks, that is also an option if you don't want to attend lab. I personally highly encourage attending lab. I think it's a great chance to beat other students and get help from course staff in person. But if you don't want to attend or you can't attend in person, you can do the lab on your own. As long as you do it on your own, you submit it before 9 a.m. on Wednesday. So for instance, next week's lab, you'd have to submit before next Wednesday, not after the lab, but before the lab. And you have to pass 100% of all the auto grader tests to get credit that way. We'll have weekly homework assignments. We'll have three projects where you'll get to work on larger case studies. Uh, when you go to lab, you'll learn how to submit the lab and then you'll learn how to do it. And then you could do that from home if you wanna. We'll have office hours for you. We'd be delighted if you have questions for you to come to us in office hours. We have um, a huge um, window of time when we're available for questions in office hours. There's a midterm. Please put the midterm on your calendar. The midterm will be, sorry, it's Friday night. Friday night, October 15th at 7 o'clock p.m. Um, the midterm will be uh, online. There'll be a final exam as well. Make sure you attend that. You can find more details in our course policies webpage. So if you have questions, I recommend looking there first. All right, let me talk a little bit about collaboration. The purpose of this course is to help you to learn and we encourage you to help each other. So you're very welcome to ask questions. You can ask course staff questions. You can ask each other for help. You're welcome to discuss the concepts or the, the problems you're working on with each other. Well, not exams, obviously. You can't discuss that with anyone else in the course. Um, in lab, when you're working in lab, uh, you're welcome to talk with others and work together with a, in lab. In fact, we encourage uh, working in pairs in lab, but you'll have to submit your lab assignment individually. You'll have to submit your homework assignment individually. You're welcome to discuss the problems with others, but please don't discuss your solutions. Projects you'll do either individually or with a partner. So collaboration is great, help each other out, but with some limits, you should never share your solution with anyone else, except your project partner. So I don't want you to post your solution 
um, on a forum and ask what was wrong with my code or my solution or is my solution right in a place where everyone can see. Or if someone else asks you, how do you solve this problem? I don't want you to show them. Well, here's what I, here's what I came up with. Obviously, don't copy off each other. Any kind of copying or a violation of the uh, academic conduct policies could result in severe penalties for you. So don't do it. I know that it can be really tempting when we're all online and it seems like no one's watching. Um, please um, be scrupulous uh, about avoiding that. If you need help, we are here. We would love to help you. There are multiple ways you can get help. One way is to ask a friend of yours in the course. That's great. I'd love to see people help each other. Helping each other out is a great way. Um, it's not only a great way for you to learn from someone else, but helping someone else is also a great way for you to learn. I found that one of the best ways to solidify my understanding of something is to try to explain it to something else, someone else. You can also ask on, sorry, not Piazza, Ed. You can ask on Ed, our discussion forum, and we'd be glad to help you, or maybe another student will help you. Or you could come to office hours. That's great too. We love seeing you in office hours. Um, please don't feel scared. We don't bite. We're delighted to see you there and we want to help. You are also welcome to sign up for a tutoring section. Tutoring sections are optional. They're a great resource if you feel like you would like more practice or more help, or if you're struggling or just want to do spend more time with the material so you get more solid. We offer optional small group tutoring sections. These will be, each section will have four to five of you, be one hour a week, uh, be a chance to practice, and we'll have a member of course staff there to guide you and help you during this. We'll have post signups in a few weeks. We're not ready to begin tutoring yet. Um, we do ask that if you sign up for tutoring that you commit to attend everyone because we don't, we have limited spaces available for tutoring. Um, if you're stuck, try to solve it and then come ask someone for help. You could tell them um, what your current understanding is and what piece you're struggling with. Don't sit and spin your wheels for three hours with no clue how, what to do or where, where to go. If you're sitting in lab and, and your code isn't working right, you don't have to sit there for a half an hour desperately struggling to figure out how to make it work. You can ask for help. It all need help. We all went through this. Every one of us went through this process. Part of what we're trying to do to get you to learn is to give you tasks that are difficult. They're just beyond the level of what you already know how to do. So there are going to be times when you're not going to know what to do and that's okay. Um, I mentioned about collaboration. We'd love for you to help each other learn. The purpose of this course is for you to learn. Support each other. Um, establish a positive community. You're going to spend a lot of time with each other in this course, and we want you to um, be kind and be respectful to each other and help each other succeed in this course. This is not a zero-sum game. We, all, we can all succeed together. Please be respectful to our course staff. They are here to help you learn and they really wanna do that. You can find a link to the course policies page on our website. So what I wanna do now is I wanna to shift to showing you an example of um, some of the kind of data analysis we might do and the software environment we're gonna be working with. Before I do that, let me pause and just see if there are any questions that people would like to have answered. Um, can you kind of go over what the homework is for the class? Homework, we'll have a weekly homework you'll do on your own. It's, it's practice with the ideas and the concepts. Um, we'll give you some problems. Um, we'll post them uh, each week. And they're posted Friday, correct? I believe. Yeah, I believe so. Friday and do on Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. The uh, textbook you can find at inferentialthinking.org.
Here, I'll show you what it looks like. Whoops. Professor, are what? these tutoring That's sessions right. going to be in person? I had that wrong. Inferentialthinking.com. If you go to inferentialthinking.com, there's the textbook. You can see what this looks like, and you can read through, and there's chapters, and the chapters correspond to what we're lecturing on. The tutoring sections, uh, yes, will be in person. You will find a link to the homework online on the course webpage. Everything you need uh, will be on the course webpage or announced on Ed. So on the course webpage, when we release the homework, you'll find a link. If you attend labs in person, you don't need to pass 100% of the auto grader tests, um, but you do need to be there. You need to be working diligently on it and you'll need to get checked off and your lab your lab in, uh, instructor will, will talk you through what to do when you get to lab. All right, time for a demo. <laughs> I wanna show you the software we're gonna be using. All right, can you see this? Great. All right, so what uh, we're gonna be using is we're gonna be using the Python programming language and Jupyter Notebooks. Notebooks. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. Everything you're going to need to do uh, programming wise, you're gonna do through your web browser. So you're gonna open a web page, and it'll look something like this. This is uh, called a notebook, a Jupyter Notebook. And a notebook allows you to type in computer code and run it and see what the results are. So what we have here in a notebook, a notebook has a bunch of, we call them cells. Each one of these blocks with a rectangle here is a cell and you can type something in. You can type um, some code in and then you can ask the computer to execute that code, to run that code and you can see what the result of that code is. Up at the top, you have some menu bars that let you do stuff with this notebook. This is all running on our computers in the cloud, not on your machine. So you get to use all the computational power of our servers. Uh, every one of you are going to have your own copy of each of these things. So you don't have to worry about screwing up someone else's copy. You don't have to install any software. All you need is a web browser. So each cell can have some code in it written in this Python programming language. And then you can run a cell. So this first cell has a whole bunch of stuff. And I don't want you to even try to understand what any of that is. That's some boilerplate that sets up the computing environment we're going to use in this course. Then you can select a cell and click the run button up here. And that will run the code that will tell the computer, please execute that code. So let me show you an example of using a cell. We can type something into a cell and we can use, uh, one thing we can use Python for is it's a very simple uh, calculator. So here I'm gonna type in two plus seven and then I'm gonna click run. And that runs the Python code and the computer figures out the answer is nine and it shows me the answer is nine. So what I typed was here and what the computer gave me was there. And of course I can do more complicated things. and it shows me the answer, okay? Uh, now, there's a little bit of a keyboard shortcut that's kind of handy, so you don't have to type and then press this run button. Um, I can press um, control enter, and that will run the cell for me. Yeah, shift return is very nice. Yeah, you can do shift return, shift enter. Okay, so um, 
what I want to do now is I want to show you a demonstration of the power of what we can do using computing. One of the things that we've done to make this course more accessible is instead of teaching all the statistics using fancy math and calculus, you don't need to know any calculus for this course. We're going to use um, some computer, computer programs to do the work for us, which means First, we need to teach you how to write computer code, how to write computer programs. So uh, for this demo, I've written you some computer code. You don't need to understand this. You don't need to follow this. Don't worry if none of this computer code makes sense to you. It shouldn't make sense to you. This is just an example of the kinds of things we could do with this environment once you know how to write some computer code. What I've done here is I have written in advance some code here that downloads a copy of Huckleberry Finn and loads it into the computer and then splits it apart um, by chapter. And I'm going to show you um, what we get. Here um, is the result. This is the text of Huckleberry Finn downloaded from the web. And then you can see here it begins. You don't know about me without you have read a book, so on and so forth. Okay. So that's now in the computer, and that's now data in the computer, and so we can now analyze it. So I've split this up into um, chapters. Um, so we can, in this uh, class, we're going to organize a lot of our data as tables. So let's do that. Um, here I have uh, put this into a table. This is uh, what a table looks like. It has a bunch of rows and a bunch of columns. And here I have one row per chapter. Another thing I could do is um, I could count. It's kind of a silly thing to do, but we're going to do it. Count um, the number of times um, the word Tom appears in each chapter. Don't worry about what this code I'm typing does. I'm not expecting you to know it. What this has given me is it's given me a bunch of numbers, one number per chapter. For instance, in chapter one, the computer figured out that Tom appears six times. And in chapter two, Tom appears 24 times and so on and so forth. This is what computers are great at. If you have a really tedious job, like scan through the entire book and count how many times the word Tom appears, computers are wonderful at that. They spare us from the tedium. All right, so what... What could you see from this data here, these numbers? What does this tell me about Tom? Anything? It he shows up mostly in the things. end? Yeah. 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 It doesn't appear kind of maybe in the first few chapters. And then there's a long, long period where Tom really isn't mentioned much. He doesn't seem to be a big part of the book. And then in the last dozen chapters or something like that, then he's really important. Um, another character is Jim. So we could um, do the same thing for Jim. And here's the answer for Jim. I see, oh, Jim shows up more kind of throughout the book. All right, so we could do this for Tom and Jim and Huck. And these numbers are kind of a little unwieldy. So um, remember I said we're going to use tables. Let's put that in a table. I've written in advance some code that will do that. And here we get a table that looks like this. So we have one row per chapter, and we have one column per uh, person in the book. And this is maybe just a little bit more organized way to have the data. You could think of this as kind of like a spreadsheet, but it's now in this computer um, environment where we can manipulate it using our computer code. Uh, now, having all these numbers in a table maybe is a little hard to follow because how do I make sense of a gazillion numbers there? So when you got a whole bunch of data, too much data to really make a lot of sense of, use, that's right, visualization. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna visualize. And I wrote in advance some code to now take that table and then um, compute a cumulative count. For chapter one, what's the total number of times Tom appeared in chapter one? For chapter two, how many times did he appear in the first two chapters and so on? And then um, visualize that, plot that. So we get a graph that looks something like this. Okay, so maybe this is a little bit easier way to make sense of the numbers. 
And now if one thing we can see very clearly is that Jim is mentioned a lot in the book. Jim is really important and important throughout the book. You can see that Tom, the yellow line for Tom is pretty flat for a large part of the book, indicating that he's mostly not present. And then near the end, it rises very rapidly, indicating that he's mentioned a lot. And finally, Huck. The book is called Huckleberry Finn, but Huck doesn't seem to appear very much anywhere in the book. Why is that? Any ideas? First person. Yes, it's written in first person. So Huck is the author and he's uh, writing from his point of view. So, of course, his name, the word Huck doesn't appear very often, even though Huck is very important in the story. By the way, you, can, you don't have to just watch me do this. You can follow along in your own web page, in your own web browser, and play around with these notebooks. So let me show you how to do that every lecture. If you go to the course web page, go to the course web page, you will see here a link. Do you see this link that says demos? If you click on that link demos, what that will do is that will... Oh, I'm not signed in, but that will uh, log you into our servers and we'll load up this notebook, make your own personal copy of the notebook and load it up and um, let you um, play around with the notebook and you can make changes and run cells and modify something and run it again and see what that affects. And it won't hurt anyone else because you've got your own private copy. Okay, so you could follow along during lecture in your own copy if you want and even try stuff. Yeah, you'll be doing you'll be doing your labs and your assignments in Jupyter notebooks. So we're doing it by opening up a notebook, editing it, changing stuff there and then submitting it and we'll show you how to submit it. This this code was particularly simplistic. I only counted the number of times Huck appeared. Now that said, if um, the Huckleberry appeared, actually that starts with Huck, so that would get counted too, but that was just kind of a fortunate coincidence. So this is kind of naive code and there are more sophisticated ways to work with textual data, but I'm just trying to do something simple here that gets us close enough. Yes, you're all logging in and you are killing our servers. I love it. That means we need to go work on increasing the capacity. Um, if you get an error message, you might have to wait 10 minutes and try again. This is the stress test. We have some of the world's developers of Jupyter Notebook here. And one of the reasons why they volunteer to help us maintain our course website is because I think we have the largest Jupyter server in the world, at least the last I heard, um, with all of the Data 8 students all trying to access it at once. So this is a stress test on their software and it helps us improve the Jupyter software. All right, so I want to do the same thing, but now I want to talk about, instead of Huckleberry Finn, I want to talk about another wonderful book, Little Women. I don't know if you've read it, but it's a lot of fun. And Little Women, um, for those of you who have read Little Women, you know that it's a coming-of-age story. It's a coming-of-age story about four sisters. Uh, the book starts with them as young children, um, and they grow up, and they um, build an adult life, and you see the progression of them. And the four sisters are, let's see, Amy, Beth, Joe, and uh, Meg. Meg? Meg. Yes. And it starts off like this. Christmas wouldn't, won't be Christmas without presents. Um, and what's going on here is they're super, super poor. They can't afford any gifts for each other. And the book starts at an early Christmas where uh, they're super poor. Okay. So, um, beloved book. Let's do the same thing. Many times each of these uh, people, uh, their names are mentioned in Little Women and do a count by chapter and uh, uh, do the same thing. Visualize that data and see what we can tell. And I, here I'm going to do this for the four sisters, Amy, Beth, Joe, and Meg. And also... Uh, for Lori, who's uh, the boy next door. Um, and that creates a table. And then we're going to count this, have cumulative counts. And I'm going to visualize it. And here we can see some things from this visualization. 
For instance, here you can see what's the line that's um, growing the fastest. Well, that's the blue line. That's Joe. Joe is mentioned a lot in this book. If there was someone who was going to be the primary character, maybe it's Joe. Joe is wonderful. Um, you can also see, um, uh, what else can you see? Yeah, you can see other stuff like Meg doesn't get mentioned much near the end. And let me, let's, let's try, uh, let's try another one. You can see Lori there. Lori is the green line. Um, uh, spoiler alert. Um, Lori um, ends up marrying one of the four sisters. I want you to take a moment, look through this and see if you can figure out from this data, who does Lori marry? Amy, yes. Someone want to type in the chat? How did you know? Yeah, their lines are the similar kind of wiggly shape to their lines. When, when Lori's line goes up, so does Amy's. And when Lori's line is flat, so is Amy's. And what does that mean? In chapters where... Lori is getting mentioned a bunch. Amy's getting been mentioned a bunch. And in chapters where Lori's not getting mentioned, Amy's not getting mentioned over here. You see how these lines kind of are parallel? And that kind of makes sense. What that indicates is they're a couple and they get mentioned together. When one is mentioned, they're both mentioned. And, and other chapters, when one of them's not mentioned, but neither of them are mentioned. So you can see sometimes from this data, um, interesting trends and patterns that um, lets you learn something about the entire book. In this case, we didn't have to read the book and we learned, we learned a little bit of interesting stuff here. Okay, um, let's do a little bit more with this uh, data. Um, we could look at instead of um, how many times the different people are mentioned, um, we could do a different experiment. One thing that's interesting is to look at elements of a writer's style. And I'm going to do a very simple measure of that, which is I am going to, instead of counting the number of times Tom appears, I'm going to count the number. Well, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to count, estimate the average length of the sentences in the book. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to count the number of periods. Each period indicates the end of a sentence for the most part. And so if I look at the length of a chapter, the number of letters in that chapter divided by the number of periods in that chapter, that will give me the average sentence length, the average um, <coughs> length of a sentence in that uh, chapter. <coughs> now, this would be super tedious as we're getting mentioned in chat, super tedious to compute by hand. You could be sitting there making tallying marks all day, super tedious. Anytime you find yourself doing super, something super tedious, that's when get a computer to do it for us. Okay, so I got the computer to do it for us. It already did it. And let's look at some of these numbers. Here is a table showing for Huckleberry Finn, um, one row per chapter. The first column shows the number of uh, letters, the length of that chapter. And the second shows the number of periods. So you see, if we divide the first number by the second number, we get the average length of sentences in that um, chapter. And we could get the same thing for Little Women. Now that's still a lot of numbers and a lot of data and it's really hard to make sense of. So what should we do when we've got too much data? Well, a good place to start is with a visualization. So let's look at a visualization. And here we have a visualization of the data. And let's see if you can see this. Maybe I make this plot a little smaller. It will all fit in here. Um, we have here in the blue, we have Huckleberry Finn, and we have in yellow, we have Little Women. And one thing you might notice is that there's a diagonal line here. These fall roughly along a diagonal line, and that's because there is, for each author, a roughly typical average sentence length. And that's about the same for all the chapters. So it kind of makes sense that they would be roughly along a diagonal line. The slope of that line indicates the length of the average sentence. And you could imagine that might tell us something about the author. For instance, books that have a very short sentence length, maybe those are 
action books, really, you know, short, punchy sentences. Joe shot the gun. He jumped over the fence. He ran away. Um, and really long ones might be um, uh, more abstract, uh, setting a scene. Okay. The second thing you can see here, this is kind of interesting, is the average sentence length is the same for these two books. And in fact, if we look at text, we find that across many authors, there is a common commonality among many people that we tend to write sentences of roughly the similar length on average. All right, so this is an example of the kind of data analysis you could do. Um, we will be teaching you in this course how to do this kind of data analysis. So what I'm gonna do now is I'd like to wrap up. Last remarks. We are um, out of time. Um, thank you so much for coming today and for putting up with our Zoom difficulties. Lab starts this week. So we'll see you in lab. Do go to lab. Lab attendance is mandatory. You, if you're enrolled, you should have received an email with your lab time. Go to your assigned lab time this week. Have a great time in lab, and I will see you in lecture on Friday. Thank you, Thank you. all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go Bears. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Have a good rest of your day, sir. Thank you. Hi, can I ask a question about lab? Yes. Um, give me just a second here. I need to figure out how to get my Zoom to cooperate. Thank you for your patience. I seem to be having some difficulty with my Zoom. All right. Um, I would be glad to answer any questions that anyone might have. And Will, maybe you could make me um, host again. Sorry to bother you. Oh, no I worries. kicked out of Zoom somehow. Um, yes, let me do that. So maybe what you could do is you could raise your hand. Um, and uh, I will call on you, or you could type your question in the chat, and I'd be glad to answer questions you might have. Leon. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to clarify for labs, when we say it's uh, signed on Monday and then due on Wednesday, is that Wednesday the week after, or is that Wednesday like two days after? Two days after. Um. So if our like labs uh, times are on like Thursdays, like would we? Um. So that's like after the due date, and then we would go to the lab section to like work on it if we had trouble doing it before. Or the, what I encourage the encourage method. We offer you two options for for lab. The encourage method is go to your lab and then you'll get credit. You don't need to worry about this due date or anything. You're good. The other option is if you can't go to your assigned lab section or you don't want to, then you do it in advance. So that's when this due date comes in. That's the Wednesday 9 a.m. due date. That's before your lab. So mm -hmm. you would need to in advance, you know, Monday night, Tuesday, look for the lab online and do it on your own and turn it in early. You could, if you wanted, do it on your own in advance. And then if you get stuck, go to your lab. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, if you can't make it to lab this week because you won't be on campus this week, we have some online labs. Please pick one of them and go to them uh, for this week. This week only, um, 
uh, weeks after that, we'd like you to attend your assigned lab. If that's a problem after this week, please get in touch with us and we'll work out some accommodations for you. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, if you're on the wait list, attend any of the online labs. This week, attend any of the online labs. Uh, that's only going to be an option for this first week. Um, we're figuring out what we can do for those of you on the wait list for labs after the first week, and we'll make a post on Ed, but I just don't have a plan fully worked out yet. Will everyone on the wait list be enrolled? I think it's unlikely at this point. Um, the last time I looked, there were three or 300, 350 or 300 people on the wait list. My usual rule of thumb is that um, something like 10% or 15% maybe, but typically more like 10% of the class will drop. Um, and so uh, people be enrolled into the wait list, enrolled off the wait list as people drop. So if 10% drop, that sounds like maybe 140 maybe might, I would be my guess for how many might drop. So something in that vicinity might make it off the wait list, but I doubt that everyone on the wait list will make it into the course, unfortunately. I'm very sorry about that. We will offer the course again next semester and in the spring uh, if you're not able to get into the course this semester. Uh, Praneet? Um, yes, hi, Professor, can you? See me? Hear me? Yeah. Did I say your name right? Do you want to tell me how to say it right? It's Pranit. Pranit. Thank you. Yes. So first of all, really enjoyed the class today. Thank you for that. Um, I just had a quick question about uh, CS. So I have no prior CS experience. And uh, I just wanted to quickly understand whether, you know, I could maybe learn the basics somehow. And if there are any references or material that you could refer me to. Sure. Uh, we're going to teach you all. That's fine. We're going to teach you all mm -hmm. the basics you need to know. So the um, you actually don't need any outside references. We'll teach it to you. That's some of what we'll be doing in the first few weeks of class. Um, so I would, I would, what I would suggest is um, come to lecture, um, do the practice in the, the labs and, and the homeworks. Um, if you're stuck, read the textbook, come to office hours. Uh, if you feel like you need more material, we can give it to you, but this is designed for you. So mm -hmm. we, it's designed so you don't need to be reading external materials to follow up. Okay, perfect. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fook, I see you're next. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you well. Oh, okay. Uh, I just want to ask if uh, there's an option to download the PDF file for the textbook uh, on a website, because uh, I try to print that and it only give me the option to bring the first page of the book only. Oh, yeah, I don't know how to do it. We tried to set that up and I couldn't figure out how to make it work. It ended up with some PDF file that was like a gazillion, it was enormous and things crashed and I just couldn't. So I don't have a PDF file, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, that's fine then. <laughs> uh, Nicole? Hi, Professor. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm just wondering where does the homework usually will be uploaded and where can we submit our homework usually? It'll be uh, on the course website. So you go to the course web page and it's not there now because it'll be yeah. only released on Friday, but on yeah. Friday um, evening, you should be able to go to the course web page. There'll be a link for the homework, for homework one. You click on that link, that will take you to a notebook where you'll do your work. You'll modify the the notebook and to fill in your answers. And then um, you will submit it from that notebook. And when you go to lab this week, we're going to have you do the submit. So you'll see how to do the submit. Okay. Process. And when is it usually due for the homeworks? Uh, due on Thursdays. So Thursday. released on Friday, Thursday. due the next Thursday. Okay. Got it. Thank you so much, Professor. Sure. 
Jenna. Hi. Hi. I just have just quick questions. Is there any online tutoring session section? I don't know yet whether we're going to have online sections. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a good guess that we'll have at least some, but we haven't set it up yet. Mm. Okay, so, but we have an office, online office hour, right? Yes, so office hours will have you. both in person and online office hours. Um, okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Juan, I see you had a question there. If you complete the lab before Wednesday 9 a.m., if you don't go to lab and you complete the lab on your own and you complete it by Wednesday 9 a.m. and you pass 100% of the auto grader tests, then you'll get 100% full credit on the lab. If you do it on your own and you turn it in after the Wednesday 9 a.m. or you don't pass 100% of the auto grader tests, maybe you fail just one auto grader test, you don't get any credit for lab. So if you go to lab in person, we'll make sure you get full credit and you don't have to get pass all the tests. But if you want to do it on your own, you got to complete the whole lab and pass every single test and get all the all the answers right. Hope that helped. Uh, Seper, tell me how to say your name. Hi, it's Seper, like the fruit pear. Seper. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you. I, I was just wondering uh, what general recommendations do you have, like anything you, you, you would recommend for us to like succeed in this course? Uh, uh, first would be um, stay, keep on track with the course. In other words, don't fall behind. And if you do fall behind, uh, come ask for help. Um, uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens. And then if you get several weeks behind, it's hard to catch up. So that'd be the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing I would say is, um, Consider like a study group or a study buddy or a friend who you might study together with. Um, you figure out what works best for you. But like for me, I found like that really helped me. It kept me accountable. It like helped me understand stuff because there was stuff that I understood that they didn't and vice versa. And so we could help each other out. Um, those are probably the main two things. Um, and uh, keep going with the course material we give you. We're going to give you lots of practice in the labs and homeworks. And so just keep up with that. And, um, and that should help you and see how you're doing. And if everything's going okay, then you don't need to do any more. And if things are not doing great, then, then come for help. You might sign up for a tutoring section or you might come to office hours or, or ask on ed or um, yeah, come, come talk to us if it's, if it's not going well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Xinyin, I saw you asked about um, lab worksheet. No, you don't need to do the, you don't need to look at the lab worksheet before you go to labs. The worksheet you'll work on when you get there. No, no prep. You don't need to prepare for lab. You don't, okay, just go. Thank you. You're welcome. If you want, you can print out the worksheet and bring it with you. We won't, because of COVID, we won't have printouts of the worksheet available for you. So you, I would suggest either bringing a tablet where you can open up the worksheet or printing it out beforehand. We'll also project it on the screen, but maybe you might like to have your own personal copy. But you don't need to look at it or think about any of the problems or do any of it before lab. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's call it a wrap. Thanks so much for coming today. Oh, wait, one more. Ooh. The example of these books, do the texts have to be saved on specific some specific platform? No problem. That is fine. You don't need to have a computing background. Yeah, you don't, you're not going to have to save it anywhere. It's going to be, you're going to access it through your browser. And your, your browser is going to go to our web server. It's going to be saved on our servers. And then the computer, our servers are going to run, run your code on our servers. So it'll get all saved on all servers and everything. You don't have to like, yeah, you should be good. Navrit. Hi, Professor Wagner. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, 
So essentially the main components of data eight lecture itself would be the homework and projects. Of lecture. Well, lecture, you'll just come. There's no. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And then for lab, we wouldn't have to, if we're planning on going in person, we wouldn't be needing to prepare beforehand. And it, right. lab itself will be completed in lab, right? Yep. Okay, got it. Thank you. Have a nice rest of your day. You too. Hi, John. Um, for the auto grader tests, are there like unlimited tries for that? We'll give or... you unlimited tries on the labs. So okay. the labs are, are basically, um, if you go there in person, you will get full credit as long as you're working diligently on it. Um, but for the homeworks and the projects, it's going to be a little different. Um, we're going to be, um, basically, you're not really going to get unlimited tries. You're not going to see when you write your answer, you're not going to immediately see that it was correct or that it was wrong. Um, we're going to wait until after the deadline and then we're going to grade everybody's using some, some tests. So we may have for your homeworks, a few tests that catch some mistakes, but most of them, uh, won't like, won't run for you until after the deadline. And that's kind of a trade-off that it would be nice if we gave you multiple chances. But on the other hand, we found that when we did, sometimes people would like, for multiple choice questions, just kind of guess each of them in turn, and then they weren't actually really engaging with the question. So this is our kind of compromise attempt to support learning and also remove temptation to practices that won't help you. Thank you. Thank you. Last call. Anyone else? Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.